Our speaker today is Mike McConaughey. And he's been the head men's basketball coach at Northwestern State University since 1999. And really has done a remarkable job uh, improving the program since he took over at that time. They've uh, really had successful seasons. He's won uh, conference coach of the year a couple of times. Uh, and he's going to talk to you today a little bit about that. And also just kind of his philosophy on uh, working with his players. He played collegiate at Louisiana Tech and was actually inducted into their Sports Hall of Fame in 2011. So please join me in welcoming Coach Mike McConaughey.
proudest of with our staff that we graduated every player since 2007. We've graduated 89.4% of our players since I got there. To give you an idea, um, the national average is like 51 or 2% of, stu of student athletes graduate. So that's very, very important. We just recently were recognized for um, an APR um, recognition, which we're ranked in the top 10% in the nation with all the Ivy League schools. And what APR is, and I don't know if you read the sports page, sometimes there'll be something about APR. Well, Academic Progress Report is a report that is given each year. It's based off of you get four points per student athlete. For men's basketball, you have 13 scholarship players, so you get four points per player. You get a point for them being eligible at the end of the first semester. You get a point for them coming back in the spring. You get a point for them passing again in the spring and then being eligible to return in the following fall. And so they figure that out. Well, you have to score 930. So that's the benchmark NCAA gives you. We've had uh, our rolling average of four years, which they give you a rolling average in case you have a bad year. And uh, ours is 996 over the last four years. So we've been very successful with that. But how is that, why is that important? I'm not sure exactly why they picked the way they did it. But the point is that young people, men and women that are athletes, are really truly really held to a higher standard in the classroom because everybody's seeing what they're doing. And we constantly have to tell our athletes that, you know, you're held to a higher standard. You say that that's not necessarily fair, but that's the way it is. You're playing on Saturday night or Saturday afternoon, and everybody wants to know that you're being productive in the classroom. And so we really preach that. But that, that score, you can really, there are schools in our state that have had struck, have struggled with it. Uh, our actual APR score is higher than any state in Louisiana. We graduated more players from South of College, which so is ranked number one in the state of Louisiana. The only school that's higher than us is Tulane. And so those things are important because I think it's important people understand that we're, we're using the game to get an education so that our young men in Northwestern can be productive. And that, that's what it's all about. And I always tell kids when we talk to them that when you come to Northwestern and I'm your basketball coach and our staff takes you on, this deal isn't a two-year deal if you're a junior college player or a four-year deal. It's a lifetime investment because you will be a part of my life the rest of my life and the rest of your life. I'll give you an example that about a week ago I had a kid call me from uh, Oklahoma City. He was a junior college player was a complete pain in the backside his senior year. But one of the worst cases of senioritis I've ever experienced. And here's what he said, Coach, I remember all the things that you told me. I didn't understand them then. And he starts telling me a story, because I always go to the grocery store and get really mad when people don't put their basket back where it's supposed to be. <laughs> he tells me the story that I told him about do what you're supposed to do. If you use something, you put it up. So I guess the point I'm making, I really didn't realize that even that story that I was telling that young man that was frustrated with me because he wasn't playing enough, it stuck. He's fixing to get his master's degree, and he, run, he works in social services in Oklahoma City. And so those are the kind of things I'm leaving by you for my business that make it worth doing because the, the games really and truly people always say, well, Mike, don't you just love the games? I absolutely hate games. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of my trademarks, I guess, is, is this will tell you how much I hate games. Every other coach that I coach against is in the back room before the game, and they're back there, I guess, designing plays that might never work. And I go around and I shake hands with everybody that came to the game. And people always say, well, coach, I don't really understand why you do that. And I said, well, the first thing is in today's age, people could stay at home and watch 40 basketball games if they wanted to, if they had enough television channels. But they chose to come to our game. And I found the other reason is it's hard to call me bad names if I just can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so 
I do that, and I have a lot of fun with it, and I, I know that some people find it kind of odd, but it's very enjoyable. And I know uh, the man has come to our games this morning and said, don't you need to go get ready to play? And I'll set, use the line. My dad coached at Bozier High School uh, back in the 50s and uh, early 60s, and his line was always, son, the uh, haze in the barn. You know, there's not anything else we can do from here to the time the game starts, so I always generally use that. But uh, the season, the season, the past season that we played was really, really an interesting season. I guess you always are trying to come up with something to talk about, about your year. We ended up getting beat in the uh, semifinal game against Stephen F. Austin team that had a remarkable year. But we were picked to win. And we just had a hard time. We couldn't ever get the chemistry right. Uh, kind of senior, that senioritis I talked about was, it was very prevalent. And um, we opened the season okay. We, we win a game at home and go down and beat Auburn. Beat, uh, I can't say it that way, hung is what someone would say. You hung 72 on Auburn at Auburn. And if I left, somebody said, we appreciate you getting the coach fired. It's no question. So the next night we go to LSU and we're playing LSU. The reason we play back-to-back games, we, we play games like Auburn, LSU. This next year we got a and Texas Tech, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. It's guaranteed games, which allow our university's budget to be, you know, padded a little bit by getting the checks they write because those schools write pretty good checks. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty good at that. Um, Auburn was supposed to pay us 80 on Thursday night, but they want to move the game to Friday night. I said, we'll be glad to do it for 85000 Give me $5,000 raise, then we beat them. <laughs> <laughs> then we played LSU that next night. It was, it was playing pretty strong and uh, ended up having one of our players had a great night. Get hurt the next that day. And we kind of went into a tailspin. Lafayette wore us out down there. They come to our place this year. We'll be glad to get them in Natchitoches and pray for hopefully we can return the favor. But we kind of up and down. It was really struggling. We were playing uh, a team, the worst team in our league. I won't say the name of the school, but we get beat on a tip in at the buzzer. All we have to do is block the guy out and tip us in. And, and I'm, I'm furious, and, but I don't really say much. And, uh, we had had a technical foul call earlier in the game. I never had this happen before because one of my players got the ball and handed it to the other team and the official called a technical. And I was pretty frustrated with, with that in general. But uh, Van Chancellor, who used to be the coach of Ole Miss, and he traded and went to LSU. Oh, and that was a disaster. <laughs> but Van was at the game, and I talked to him a long time after the game, and I called him the next day and visited with him. And I, I had said we were going to have to do something different this year anyway, because the rules were supposed to change to where you, if you put two hands on somebody, it's a foul. And so they were just calling fouls left and right until they got to the NCAA tournament this year, and then they started playing mug ball again. And, and so we started playing, I brought a guy in to uh, show us how to play zone, a different kind of zone. And I haven't played zone in combined total years that I've been. Coach McGurry, that's a bad word for him to hear zone. But we started playing zone this year. We won after the first game, I'm not going to count. After that game, we went 12 out of 15 games and won 12 out of 15 playing a zone that I've never played before in our life. And it really taught me something because, you know, you don't have to do the same thing the same way every year. And your people that you're coaching, sometimes they just can't do it. And we had to make that adjustment. And when I made that adjustment, my, all my coaches looked at me like I was crazy. I walked in on Monday morning after the Houston Baptist game. I said, hey, we're fixing to start playing the zone. I said, don't try to talk me out of it because that's what we're going to do. And I said, the first time I make a three-point shot, don't come to me and say, hey, coach, we need to get out of the zone. Because if we were playing man-to-man -man and they made a three-point shot, you wouldn't say, hey, hey, we need to play zone. And that, that's just kind of the way that works. So this year was really kind of an interesting year, and it's given me, I don't know if you get a shot in the arm or what, but I, I'm kind of energized a little bit, even though we've had success once in the tournament, NCAA tournament a year ago. This year we, we didn't make it to the tournament. But I think the reason I'm excited is because we've got some good young players coming back, and we play a very challenging schedule with the schools I mentioned, as well as Lafayette. 
Louisiana Tech and Monroe will play those schools as well, and then our conference teams will play as well. But we've got a young man from Bossier City, Louisiana, and Jalen West, and just signed a fifth name, Devontae Hall from Bossier High School. Uh, here's an interesting story. I went to go uh, do my home visit with Devontae, and I, I knew the address looked familiar. And when I got to the house, it was a house that some buddies of mine owned 15 years, 16 years ago. <laughs> Little did I know that I'd be coming back to that house. Um, looked a lot better than when I had it. Those guys didn't help me very much. <laughs> but, uh, and then there's Zeke Woodley from uh, Pelican, Louisiana, and then Marvin Fraser from Zawali. And I mentioned those kids because our program has basically been built off of Louisiana kids. And we've got a few kids from out of the area, probably more than we've ever had before, because this is kind of, in the recruiting world, there's no perfect situation where every year you're going to have the guards or the bigs that you need to get. And we just were unfortunate in getting any, any big players. We tried very hard to get some out of Louisiana, but we didn't get them, so we had to go off. So we ended up with a 6'11 and a quarter kid from Florida, and then a 6'10 kid that's from, actually, is from North Dakota. So we... Uh, we kind of really expanded our areas there. But I want to tell you a, a, a quick little story about Zeke Woodley because I think it's one of the most interesting things that I've ever been involved with. Zeke went to Pelican High School. Pelican High School was closed this year. Well, when we signed Zeke, I, you know, I was just excited. I mean, he is phenomenal. This guy is just uh, as, as good an athlete as I've ever coached in all the years that I've been coaching. Really a real quiet young man. He doesn't talk. He came in with a, a really good grade point average and did an excellent school this year, but he just doesn't talk very much. But there's two things. The first story I'll tell you about him was the, the support that he brought from Northwestern. When Pelican closed, there was no place for those people that had been following Pelican High School since Pelican High School was open to go, there wasn't a team for them to go see anymore, unless they had a grandchild playing at Mansfield or Converse or Stanley or wherever they might go. So guess where they all ended up? They all ended up at Northwestern Nackers. I mean, this is, I'm not exaggerating, there'd be 30 to 40 people from Pelican, that area, that would be coming to watch this young man play. And it was interesting because after the game, it was like kind of like old high school night because all of them would hang around and they'd be up there with him. But Zeke, like I said, doesn't talk much. He's a guy that can go turn six flips this way and six flips back this way and just is remarkable. And a lot of big schools recruited him, but he's a six foot, one and a half to two inch guy that for some reason they put six four, but when they show up, they're always two inches short. <laughs> so the big guys would go into Pelican if they could find Pelican. Okay? And, I mean, I know how to get there. And they come back, and when he's just not as big as, as we thought, where do we play him? Well, you know, my theory is you take a player and you play him where he needs to play, and then you adjust everywhere around him. But Zeke doesn't talk at all, but he can, he can really play. But one day in practice, I was trying to get a point across to him, because when you've been... The guy that, that goes out and scores every point nearly that your team scores, they won back to back state championships up there. You don't get, you don't go pick set picks for guys that do stuff like that. They pick for you. So I said, Zeke, I want you, we're going to work on this, and you're going to go set the pick for Daquan, and you're going to open up the ball. And he had this real perplexed look on his face. And I realized he'd never set a pick for anybody because he was always getting the pick before he could score. But one day we were in practice, and I was trying to get him to run the baseline really, really hard. And he, uh, I remember that he said, but I couldn't come up with anything to come across to him to figure out what we needed to do to get him to do that. I said, see, see, you told me you play baseball. And he shook his head, didn't say anything. So I start going through the positions. And finally, we get to shortstop, and he shakes his head. He just is a smart kid, but he just doesn't talk and his mother would even say, is he talking much? <laughs> so I said, see, you told me you played shortstop. You told me you played baseball, or you agreed that you did. I said, do you remember when you hit the ball and you ran from home plate to first base, how hard you had to run? 
And he shook his head. I said, so when you run from one baseline to the other baseline, or you run from this rim to that rim when you're running the fast break, I need you to run like you're running the first play, first base. It was like the light came on. And, and what I, the point I'm making is, you know, sometimes we have to figure out how to get across to kids. And one guy might be one guy way, and another one may be another one. But really excited about having that core of kids back. Jalen West was a uh, defensive player of the year in our league. He was a mid-major uh, All-American. I mean, he is just as, you know, it's as good as I've ever seen. And I think, you know, when you've been around the game in this area as long as I have, I've seen, we've seen pretty good ones. I read an article on Robert Parrish this, this morning. Uh, unfortunately, he's not seven foot. If he was seven foot or if he would have been like your husband's Dad, Jackie Moreland, 6'9", great, great player, played in league forever. You know, that'd be a wonderful uh, thing. But Jalen's only 5'10". And he is just plays bigger than, he, than he's supposed to play. And we're just excited about those kids. And because they take care of the business, now that, you know, that sometimes that's a struggle and we don't always get them to do exactly what they need, need to do. But I think one thing I'd like to point out in closing or is that, you know, it's great to have the opportunity to play the games. And, you know, as you are here, if you follow sports or whatever, just understand we're trying to do the best of the job we can, just not on the floor, but in the classroom and off the floor, trying to encourage them to be responsible young men. Uh, doesn't mean that they're always going to make the right decisions, you know, and, but, you know, we're working very hard at that. If you have any questions, I'll do the best job I can. And, you know, I've been looking for the watch all the time. You're okay. You're okay. You got time for questions? CBSSports.com article came out, national article. Coach Black is a young man that's autistic. The first day I came to Northwestern, he was in the press conference, and he walks up and he starts telling me, he, it's like that he's been at a family reunion. That year he did go to a family reunion with me. Uh, down in the country, uh, we showed up, Coach Black, uh, Coach Black said, Coach, I'm, I'm going with you to see you. Uh, uh, whoever it was, he had met a cousin or something. They've invited me down there, so we went there. Well, Coach Black gets to school at 7 o'clock in the morning, and he leaves when the last person leaves at the end of the evening. Last week, it was, they were all gone, so it was me, and I left at 8.30, and I took him to his house. And he's just a remarkable guy. He can keep up and tell you when we play, who we beat when, what's our game, game schedule next year, but he's called Coach Championship because he coaches with each team, and he goes a lot of times on the road with us, and, and, and he's a very calming effect. He's a little a little heavy on the pocketbook, though, because you've got to feed him pretty regularly. <laughs> but uh, the Brights do come. The Brights uh, come, to all, come to a lot of road games, and we enjoy and appreciate you coming down. And, but he's really an interesting young man. Coach, you're a big philosopher. What would you say to Paul Maneri today to kind of... <laughs> i tell you what, that's pretty tough. You know, especially when you're playing as well. But if you go back to it, they weren't playing as well and they hit that spell where they go to the tournament and you win it. And, you know, I guess you could say uh, he wouldn't like this, but you know, you, you, you know, just when you ran out, <laughs> everything you had just kind of ran out at the wrong time. That's, that would be a pretty tough pill to swallow. Coach, with a mid-major like Wichita State good as well as they have the last couple of years, they give you a lot of incentive? Well, the biggest thing about it, there's there's something here on mid-majors, Wichita State. In fact, that coach was at uh, at Winthrop when we beat them. He was at Winthrop there. And we've only played him once. I don't think we're going to try to play him again because I don't want to be able to be one up on somebody. <laughs> but if you go back to Gonzaga and you hear Gonzaga and you hear Wichita State, you hear Butler. The one thing that's kind of uh, distorted, those are mid-majors, but we played at Wichita State in 05, 06, the year that we beat Iowa. And it is, was, is to this day, the most unbelievable crowd atmosphere 
than I've played in anywhere in the country. Because they had seated 10,800, they stood on their feet the whole time. We led, we were tied with 16 seconds to go ahead the ball, and somebody said, Coach, don't you think we need to get timeout? We called timeout, threw it away, they scored. I don't call timeouts anymore. <laughs> but I, to answer your question, I think that it does give you the incentive to say, if we get in a position to where we could make a run at the right time with everybody healthy, we could use them as a uh, something to look at for a, a, a goal. Uh, the guy, Ron Baker, that plays for them was not recruited at all. In fact, uh, my, our, one of my coaches, Jeff Moore, that was at Dipsy one year, uh, he said, Coach, I, you know, when he was a prep, he was red shirt sitting there, and he said, you know, I, we looked at him, but Sure wish we'd done more of a look. <laughs> no, but there again, that goes back to going way off and finding recruits and stuff like that. But hopefully it'll help us. Any other questions? Anyone more? Yeah, I just wanted to share an experience I have with Coach. You may have to this, but when I was on the grad seminary, I was a volunteer coach at School Hill Saturday. And one summer, I came up with this idea about having a summer basketball league. At the time, it was kind of complicated. You couldn't wear your school colors. The coach couldn't sit on the bench. But I had a big idea, so I sent letters to every high school basketball coach in Gary. Got my meeting, no one shows up. I later get a phone call from Coach McCarthy. He goes, hey man, I'm sorry, Mr. Keaton, how did it go? And I kind of told him what happened. He goes, oh, let me get on this thing. Well, all of a sudden, now things are moving. And we end up playing games in the summer at Bozier and Southfield. Well, the news picks up. There's a channel 12, the one channel comes out for the news, and they go right to coach. And he just turns to me and goes, I'm not the guy you want to talk to. That's the guy around me. And he immediately redirected it to me. And I was all of about 20 years old. And I'll never forget the impression he made on me. And I uh, went home to New Orleans and came back to Shreveport later. And actually, I became a volunteer coach in the for a while. I can tell you why Steve Woodley is tired or quiet. It's because after he puts 50 on you, he's too exhausted to speak. <laughs>